Canada Reads 2022. Welcome to our live stream. Um, it's, a, it's a mix of, if I look around, very uh, collegial and yet focused. Um, Suzanne Samard, Dr. Suzanne Samard, we don't give you your doctor uh, <laughs> enough respect, uh, Suzanne. Um, joking that she had to pee, which would be a first as far as I know. <laughs> Somebody leaving the set. To I, the fact that it has never happened is a bit strange. I, there, are, it, there have been times where people right after the show cuts out. <laughs> like, I got <laughs> Please make way, open the curtain. <laughs> but yeah, I know somehow, I think the human, can, the human body just yeah. focuses for the time you need to and then... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Wonderful. Woo. We'll test our bell. Looking, sounding good. I have nightmares about that bell. Seriously. I could, it triggers me. <laughs> <laughs> Malia, you are allowed to talk for the last, like, <laughs> the minute that bell goes, Malia's like, She's the only one that just like in a hundredth of a second stops I think it's talking. great. Super, super the respectful of the process. Okay. She, she's really so respectful. young, she hasn't learned to, that she can ignore adults it, yet. <laughs> it's more the uh, reflex is still fresh. <laughs> you just turn these around out to Oh, sure. Yeah, that, that okay? makes sense. That's great. Thank you. Good. Yeah, thank you. You'll notice, Tarek, that I still have all five books here, including yours on top, huh? Yeah. Just in yes. case you <laughs> thought I was trying to give you a little extra push. This is just, I need it to be like a oh, tower. Oh, man. I need it to be a tower for some reason. I'm happy that my book is small, though. Yeah. This is, um, there are pockets in which this could fit, you know? Like you could take it on an exactly. airplane in a yeah. very... I didn't talk about that actually in my defense, but it is quite. <laughs> it's, a good it's too late, I guess. One, Where were you before, Holly? Oh man! Give me these tips. If, if that's the winning statement, if that's the one oh. that pushes you over, <laughs> that'll Watch that'll out, make Mark. quite a Watch change. Out, Mark. <laughs> that'll really create some waves in the publishing oh, industry, you know. And furthermore, not only does it discuss love and discuss all these important it can fit in traumatic, your it can fit in your pocket. <laughs> Man, that would have Powerful been great. Statement. That would have been great. For comedy's sake, of course. Yep. <coughs> okay, we got about two minutes, just FYI. Okay. okay. This is yeah. a good time for these coughs and yes. uh, sniffs and, and all the rest. Of water. <laughs> there is actually a length thing to the publishing, right? Like when I was doing my book, they really were, it had to be a certain length or, or not much more than a certain really? length. Yeah. Because yeah. of the type of book that it is, is that why? I think they, in general, a there's a length. thing? Yeah. Yeah. Marketing. I had to take a third off of a book. So yeah. they liked yeah. every part of it. They just wanted each one a third less. There so. were many chapters that were cut off. Yours is a memoir. Yes. Was it Inside a, Out was, yeah. Yeah. Memoir. Was that like, um, just, I just written a memoir too, and they really did have, let's have it land in this 20 page, mm -hmm. you Spot, know, whatever yeah. it was. 260 yeah. to 280 at exactly. least, something That's like that, right? Yeah. yeah right and it's also yeah. the printing, like the cost of the print. It is very much about marketing and cost. Mechanics and, This yeah. is more expensive to print than Scarborough by a right. lot, right? Right, right. Yeah, and I had, uh, I learned about the way they print. It's like this grid of pages, you know, like 16 or something. I think it's a this grid of 16 and then they cut them up and yes. fold them. So that's why you have books oh. with extra, sometimes four blank pages mm -hmm. in it, just totally. because the grid has to be. Oh, wow. I thought that was Notes thoughtful. Pages. Yeah. Notes pages. I thought I that know. was thoughtful <laughs> authors giving me a place to write on. And then you read a book just that has overrun. no note pages. Just like, overrun, Ali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just overrun. <laughs> I thought they were thinking of me as a reader to the point where I was also like these authors who don't have the overrun, which I didn't know about. <laughs> these guys so don't care thoughtless. about me as a reader. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I learned that. 20 seconds to air, everybody. Thank you, thank you, all you guys too. 15 seconds. Nine.
This is a CBC special presentation, available in described video. It's day three of the great Canadian book debate. We started with five great titles, all with the power to connect us. We've said goodbye to two so far. Three books are still in the running. Which one will be the next to go? We'll find out today. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Hello and welcome back. We've had two days of debate and two eliminations so far. There are two more votes to go. Casting those votes is this year's panel. They have all joined me once again in the Canada Reads studio. To my left is Olympic champion Mark Tewksbury. Hello, Mark. Hello, Ali. Next to Mark is fashion writer Christian Allaire. Hello, Christian. Hello. Next to Christian and across from me in the studio is, uh, or the Canada Reads circle, I should say, is, uh, is actor Malia Baker. Hello, Malia. <laughs> Hi. Next to Malia is forest ecologist Dr. Suzanne Simard. Thank you very much. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Ali. <laughs> and finally, sitting on my right is entrepreneur Tarek Hadhad. Hello, Tarek. Hello, Ali. All right, so before we get to today's, uh, today's debate, let's talk about what happened yesterday. We did have a pretty lively and deep discussion about all the books, and at the end of the day, What Strange Paradise by Omar El Akkad was the second book to be eliminated from Canada Reads. Tarek, you were championing What Strange Paradise. Tell me how you're feeling. Um, at, at first, I was disappointed, and um, I just felt that, uh, you know, I brought this book to this discussion, and it got huge beautifully amazing, you know, spotlight that probably was not going to happen anywhere else. You know, this is a book for the moment that really connected to me personally and really supported me even yesterday when I was just, you know, thinking about all the other amazing books. But for me personally right now, I am relaxed. I'm, I'm yeah. calm and uh, I'm a free agent. So I sense it. the other panelists need to really convince me uh, really hard today. Eric has put on some glasses for the first That's time right. in the week. <laughs> let his eyes relax, I'm let the glasses today. do some yeah. of the work. That's right. uh, before we do move on, I do want to give you a moment to, um, to remind everyone why all of Canada should read What Strange Paradise. For What Strange Paradise, run, do not walk and get the book and read it. Really, for all Canadians, I, I, I'm hopeful that they're all going to connect to the, the stories, the plot, the characters, to Amir, to Vanna, to the kindness, to the cruelty. Um, this book is all about home, and I feel that I did not choose What Strange Paradise. What Strange Paradise picked me and chose me for many reasons. Um, and you know what? I was not defending the book as much as I felt the necessity to ask Canadians one main question. How would you have dealt with the situation? What would you have, what would you have done differently? Um, and you know, it is quite beautifully written book. This is what I sensed yesterday from everyone when we were discussing it. But there's certainly one thing I wanted, I didn't get the chance to respond to Christian yesterday when we were talking about kindness and what are the reasons for Vanna to be kind? And then I was really thinking about it the entire evening yesterday. I'm like, you really, you don't need a reason to be kind because this is my own experience as well with, with kindness. For a lot of people who think that the ending was, was cynical, uh, um, when I was really thinking about it more yesterday, I just felt that uh, a lot of the book is about testing the tolerance of the reader's capacity um, for the privilege of fantasies, the privilege of believing in fantasies. The entire book, especially in the after chapters, we see that everything works out and we have that uh, you know, aspirational westernness in the country that we live in, where the outcomes always are much better than the outcomes for people on the other side of the world. And probably Amir was, this is only a fantasy that Amir was running with Van and found that person who was supporting him, but this is not the reality. The reality is at the end, in the now chapter. This book is actually answering a lot of questions for us, but the first thing I started with was, why do we have to choose death to reach life? This book is about kindness, community, truth, and humanity. And I will finish with a quote by Albert Einstein, who said, um, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Thank you, Tarek. All right, and you've hinted upon this, and it, it, it reminds me to remind our, our, our listeners and our viewers that 
Uh, all these books do deal with difficult topics and you can head to cbcbooks.ca to find places to get support. All right. We've said goodbye to What Strange Paradise and Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller. Let us turn now to the book Still in Contention. We're going to play the trailers for each of the books still in the running. And the panelists championing that title will get 60 seconds to make their opening argument. And after that, we'll debate. And at the end of the show, one book will be eliminated. <sighs> Yes. <laughs> Get rid of that tension, Mark. Yes. Get rid of that tension. Selecting a book for Canada Reads, it's like a matchmaking process. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's arduous, but when you found the one, you know. So, today's question, why is the book you selected the right book for you? We're gonna go around the circle clockwise, clockwise like, like we always have this week, which means, Mark, you're up first. Surprise, you are championing surprise. the novel Washington Black by S.E. Adujan. Here's the trailer. His name is George Washington Black. Wash is a black boy living in slavery, bound to a Barbados plantation. An artistic child, Wash has designs on freedom. The hand of fate intervenes. A white man arrives, Christopher Titch. Wild. Titch introduces Wash to a wondrous world of nature and of flying machines. An act of violence sets the wheels in motion for a new life. Powered by hope, by art, and by science, Wash flies high above the clouds and sets off for adventure with freedom. Forever the destination. Mark, you know the drill well. You have 60 seconds. Why is Washington Black the right book for you to champion on Canada Reads? I deeply relate to the nuanced journey of self-discovery Washington Black takes us on. December 15th, 1998, front page headline on the Globe and Mail, sports hero declares his homosexuality. After years of lies and hiding, I was finally out. I was free. But was I? Publicly, sure. But what about inside my head, my heart? That tape that kept playing. Yeah, but you're gay. You're the fag. You're not worth it. It would be six years later, after my own journey of healing, that that voice inside my head finally stopped. But to this day, my journey of self-discovery, like all of us, continues. I'm free in mind, body, and spirit here and now, but all it takes is a trip to one of 71 countries in the world to remind me it's criminal to be myself, to be gay. What freedom means shifts for each of us and for the societies we live in. I'm still only free to a point like Washington Black. Thank you, Mark. All right. Kristen, you're up next. You're championing Five Little Indians by Michelle Good. Let's play the trailer. Kenny, Lucy, Howie, Maisie, and Clara. Five stolen children, residents of the mission school. Now adults, scattered on the seedy streets of Vancouver's downtown east side, haunted by memories. Head shaved, bodies violated, but connected by other memories too. Of furtive notes, <laughs> longing glances, secret celebrations. They seek solace and hope in each other's company. Five little Indians searching for home. Christian, 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Five Little Indians the right book for you to champion on Canada Reads? While reading Five Little Indians, I instantly recognized my family and friends in these intricate characters. As an Indigenous person, I've seen firsthand how residential schools have affected our communities. They've created a sense of distrust, anger, a loss of faith in those ruling this country. But as also, I've seen our people rise above this trauma. My grandmother, Lita, was a residential school survivor. 
She never spoke of her experiences, but I saw this as a sign of strength, a desire to not pass down her grief. She continued to encourage our family to practice spirituality and to embrace our cultural traditions, all things that residential schools tried to eliminate. This is why I love Michelle's book so much. She invites readers, especially Canadians, to understand the struggles Indigenous people face in simply existing. And she ponders what's needed for us to move forward as a national community. Thank you, Christian. All right, the final book still in contention is Scarborough, the novel by Catherine Hernandez. Malia, you chose this book for Canada Reads. Let's check out the trailer. We are the kids of Scarborough, a diverse community of the working poor, where the concrete cracks beneath the feet. At school, Miss Hina feeds us, loves us, gives us a safe space to learn, to grow. Laura, the girl lost in a cloud of neglect. Bing, the boy begging for a world without bullies. And Sylvie, the girl who makes believe to escape sadness. In Scarborough, where the concrete cracks beneath the feet, we are roses determined to thrive. Leah, you have 60 seconds. Why is Scarborough the right book for you to champion on Canada Reads? I was able to connect immediately with this book. At first, I thought it was the fact that these kids were underestimated, as I have so often felt in the past 15 years of my life. But I think why I personally connected so much isn't because I, as a Botswana-born Canadian-raised girl, am not necessarily represented in the book, but because I could see myself in others not like me. Suzanne, you took away the large range of people in poverty that it represented here and how they're so often overlooked. Christian, you took away the version of grittiness and the unpolished essence of Scarborough. Mark, even the most flawed characters trying to do their best, you felt connected to. And Tarek, you stated you don't need more than what's described in this book to get the point across and to have it offer solutions for a wide range of issues. I could see the understanding that came out of all of you while reading this book and to have such a diverse group of panelists with completely different lenses on the world be able to access this community that is not just Scarborough, but like so many across this country is really what this is all about. And that's how this book will connect us. Thank you, Malia. Well, there you have it. The three titles <laughs> still in the running for Canada Reads are Washington Black by Essie Adujan, championed by Mark Tewksbury, who clapped alone for some reason. <laughs> Five Little Indians by Michelle Good, backed by Christian Allaire. And Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez, chosen by Malia Baker. We just heard their opening argu arguments. Now it's time to debate. <laughs> We're living in divided times, and it's easy to be jaded, uh, building bridges, making connections between people who disagree or who see the world differently from you. That can sometimes feel like an impossible task. So I want to ask, which one of these books made you feel like it was possible to overcome our differences? Tarek, let's start with you. Um, I would say Scarborough was the one really who, uh, the, the book that helped me, you know, to, to think in a brighter way about the, the characters, to think that there is hope, to think that there is kindness, to think that there is support for those who are looking for that light at the end of the tunnel. You know, overcoming our differences comes from, as you mentioned, building bridges instead of just building, uh, building walls that separate us as human beings. I believe that we as humans have a lot to share. We have a lot in, in common. And we are not born with, with hatred and all of these differences in a different way. Uh, you know, if you take my skin off, if you take your skins off, we look exactly the same. We have the same number of bones. We have the same amount of blood in our bodies. And I truly felt that. I really, truly felt it through Scarborough, you know, that the message came across uh, really strongly. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it... It has to, to deal as well, not only with the characters and what the, what the author wanted us to, to know. You have to, to dig deeper into these characters, to feel them, to, to be in their shoes, really, to, to know why did they react this way? Why did Hina support Laura? Why did, you know, the supervisor reacted to, uh, to, to Miss Hina in, in, in that way? 
in, in some chapters. So for me, certainly Scarborough has, has been, uh, has been the, one of the, the greatest books that has uh, helped me to overcome these differences. Christian, because you voted against Tarek, I wanted, uh, sorry, not against Tarek, but against uh, Scarborough, I wanted to know if you, uh, you agreed with some of the... Uh... Yeah, I think as a community and, you know, in, in the Scarborough plot, you know, a lot of the characters do overcome their differences and there is beauty in that. For me, though, sometimes it was a little bit simplistic in that way. I, I think of the relationship between Bing and his mother, um, you know, from the get go, she's kind of supportive of him expressing his his queer identity. And, you know, at the end with the big, you know, karaoke performance and she's there and she's cheering him on. I thought that was beautiful. I thought it would have been more effective if she, if she at first wasn't totally comfortable with it and she, there was that sort of difference and then it led up to that performance. I just think it would have been even more beautiful versus sort of just being like happy-go-lucky the whole time. I just don't, I don't think that's an accurate representation of a lot of queer kids, unfortunately. It should be, but... Well, I wonder, I mean, I think some characters overcome their difference, but I think some characters are mired in their difference. They mm -hmm. get stuck there. So I think there's like a, a balance to me. I see mm -hmm. some of Tarek's points, mm -hmm. but I see that, you know, that community for some people was literally a dead end. It, it, there was no way out. They, they couldn't overcome the difference. Tarek, I, I like what you said about, you know, a character takes you through. It's not just the story, but how the character experiences things. And I think that it's really easy for, to forget that Washington Black is an enslaved child, boy, black and disfigured. And he go, walks through life with this difference. So he has to overcome difference every single day. And there's a, we forget about it, but I love there's a scene on a ship where a woman reacts to seeing Wash and she's disgusted by how he looks. And that scene to me is so powerful because it represented to some of my friends an embarrassment to them, an unconscious bias of how they would a approach a difference. If they were that woman on that ship, I had many friends say, I'm disgusted by, I think I would have reacted the same way as that woman. And I think a book that can give you that kind of insight is really powerful, it makes but, but, a big but Mark, connection. Mark, I just have to ask you, like, you know, throughout what I felt when in Scarborough, you know, that the main discussion was around respect and acceptance in spite of some conversations that were really negative. How did that, um, how was that portrayed in, in Washington Black? Well, the question right now is overcoming differences. That's right. Yeah. But so, we will not overcome differences without respect and acceptance. Yeah, so Wash was never disrespectful. Wash used the talent that he was given to break down barriers. He was a simple uh, drawer at first that then tapped into his prodigy and used that to get respect from Mr. Wild in the Arctic to gain respect from Mr. Goff, who I despised as a despicable character in a way because he's complex. Because at the beginning, he won't accept Wash for his daughter. He'll accept him for his talents, but he won't accept him because of all the things that I mentioned. But Malia, overcoming me difference, well. right? Overcoming the difference, Wash was able to win over Goff, who I liked a little, I, I hated a little bit last once he accepted Right, him. I think what I found interesting in Washington Black uh, with overcoming the difference, and like both of you had mentioned, the respect that came from that, the respect only came from a colonial lens. Everything that happened and all that he accomplished, as much as it was amazing that he did, you know, um, through his sciences, through his art, and how those combined it, he, didn't really have anything that I felt came from him as his history as an enslaved boy coming from Barbados. I think that was really what I was missing throughout that. And um, with Bing, speaking on about what Christian said, <laughs> had to get back there at some point. Um, but with Bing, I think the most interesting part is that we do have that kind of not acceptance part at the start, but it wasn't from his mom is the thing. Um, we got it from his father who they end up leaving uh, one of the beginning chapters in the book. Um, we see how the father puts a, a cigarette out on Bing and those are moments like that that truly show the two different perspectives and sides of this one kid and of the soul inside this one kid. I found it even more interesting, especially in the Halloween scene that comes about halfway through the book um, where Laura's standing behind him um, they're putting on makeup, the girls are. Bing tries to step forward when they offer if someone wants to put on makeup, but his mom said, not here. So there is that still bit of um, held backness that I felt through his mom, but at the end they embrace it. And that full art story is what I felt brought Bing to life in his presence. Okay, Suzanne, let me give the final word to you so that we... Uh... 
I yeah, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about some differences that weren't overcome, um, some very painful ones, and I'm gonna build on what Mark was saying. You know, one of the relationships that really struck home to me in Washington Black um, was between um, Mr. Wilde and Peter Haas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it struck me because, you know, Mr. Wilde was married and, and had children with the woman in, in the UK. And, um, and they drifted apart because really Mr. Wilde was a gay man. And he formed a relationship, at least that is what, what I read between the lines, between, with, with Mr. Peter. And yet it was so hidden. It was so under the, under the radar that you, you, as a reader, really had to fill in the gaps. And so that was, you know, that was incredible. It was in the times, but it's still our time today, as Mark so eloquently discussed. But I, I want to talk, you know, as myself, I'm actually a gay woman myself. Um, and I didn't, re I was like the woman that was off in the enshrouded empire or the, the, you know, the home back in the UK who was, who was so dis disenfranchised from her marriage. And what happened to her? She became, you know, bitter and brittle and she never really got to actualize herself. And, and I think that, you know, that splitting apart if, if LGBTQ was more accepted then and now, these people wouldn't be lost. She was lost, and even Mr. Willard was lost. And, you know, I hope that as a society, we can overcome those differences and see everybody as whole. Have to leave it there. Thank you, Suzanne. That is it for this round. Ooh. All right, home. It's a place we've spent a lot of time in the past two years. But home can be more than just a place. It can be a community, a connection, a person. It can also be a feeling, a sense of belonging and a sense of safety. Now, all three of these books, they explore the concept of home and what it means to lose it and what it's like searching for it in, in some way. So which book's exploration of home and what home means was the most compelling? Christian, let's start with you. Well, obviously, I'm going to say Five Little Indians. Um, I think there's many, you know, complexities to this. One is all these five characters are trying to find a literal home. You know, they're, they're shipped away from the, man, the, from the mission on a bus, sent to East Vancouver, and they have to rebuild their lives. And this was a real thing in the 60s and 70s. Kids were showing up in urban centers, indigenous children in groves, and they had nowhere to go and had to form their own community. And then, you know, I think Michelle does it really effectively here as she used something like CD East Vancouver to show that these were places that were really not welcoming to them and very unforgiving. And they really had to work that extra harder to find that community. And I think setting it in, a, you know, the mission, the, you know, grotesque things they see working there, um, even their apartments, you know, you get the sense they have to walk up those stairs every day. Um, it just reflects that, that inability to find home and also their mental journey of, of trying to find their people again. Malia, your thoughts on that and on the question? I thought it was, I loved Michelle Good's book, gotta be honest. I loved the topic of the story and I think how we were speaking yesterday about how it should be so strongly told, even if that is through a curricular sense, um, it, it needs to be told and it should be especially, I think I, I mean, my generation, we kind of grew up in, I grew up in Suwasan. I live on Musqueam land. That is where I'm at. And through that, I live five minutes away from the reserve. And I had the opportunity to learn from these elders. And as much as I loved that in school, and I loved Michelle's book, so it should be implanted in that. I think I found it interesting how you almost described the book as almost being very descriptive and that we could feel it and that we could go up the stairs and things like that. Whereas um, with Mark's book, I felt like we could do that as a bit of contrast and compare. With Mark's book, we could do that to such an extent where you could literally taste what's going on in the air or you could feel it. And with Michelle's book, I unfortunately didn't really feel that. I thought Mark brought a really good point up yesterday about if you haven't been there, then how would you really know? I live in Vancouver, so I was able to pinpoint these places and I think you've been there so mm -hmm. you were able to kind of um, explore around and follow these characters with a full map in your head but I think for readers outside of that area it's just gonna get lost. I would disagree but 
Am I allowed to retort? <laughs> I just Go I quick. think you know I jump in. Vancouver was so such a specific choice, and I I disagree in that. You know, she, the the grittiness of those streets and where they're working. Um, it, I could feel it very vividly, and I think it only played into the struggles that they're, you know, trying to um, find their community, and their, the, the, their literal surroundings make it difficult to do that. I think that was very effective. I, I'm, I, I will get to greediness in another part, but I think we share a lot. Like, like Ali, you said, all of our mm -hmm. characters are kind of dropped and abandoned and then have to figure out what home means for them in some sense. My book is a lot of running, and I think, Malia, you're really missing the part about Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. when, when Wash starts to form community. And he's on his own free will for the first time in his life. He's not linked to the, his job is in the scientific white European world, so he's really limited, but he doesn't let that stop himself. He, on his own free will, picks up his paintbrushes. On his own free will, he discovers marine life. On his own free will, he decides to have his, not to have his name expunged from Ocean House. He's gonna stand up for it. Those were some of the furthest limits you could go as an enslaved black boy in a European white man's world at that time. So don't underestimate Wash's ability to have his own free will. I also think home for Wash was linked to Titch, and I know that you felt that was a structural challenge. But think about, we forget, Wash was abandoned at 13 in the Arctic by the only parental figure that he knew. So it would be like asking the five little Indians to forget the trauma that brother and sister had on them and that tension in their life. It's the exact same with Wash and Titch. He needed some answers and needed some resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I love that discussion. Uh, I have to go back to a point that Mark just raised in his opening statement about freedom. Home is about freedom. And for me personally, because I have been, I was just talking to all the panelists yesterday and we were like, where is home? I'm like, it's everywhere. Home is, it's inside me. It's, it's anywhere. And we can rebuild home as much as we can find that belonging. Home needs to be connected to that belonging. Whether you find it within yourself, whether you find it within your community, whether you find it within your group of friends, this is exactly what home for me. And home for me is that sense of security, that sense of peace, that sense of, you know, uh, connectivity. And I know the theme right now is, you know, the book that connects us. Probably home can be, can be a book, you know, whatever you find that sense of belonging for yourself. But I have to disagree with um, actually the, the, some of the structures in the book that was, I felt because again, you know, I, I always go back to the, to the writing techniques. I know today was not a discussion about that. But in, in some areas, in Five Little Indians, I really felt that the book was a little bit flat and the writing was distracting. That did not really allow me to connect any of those characters to the tr true meaning of home. Uh, while at the same time, I certainly found that in, in Washington Black, uh, Wash was a little bit confused until we certainly reached the Nova Scotia part. Yeah, and I think like you can't find home in the world until you find it in yourself in a way is what the, the Washington Black is kind of saying. You have to find that sense in yourself. Suzanne, let's, uh, let's yeah, get you in here. I actually, I disagree about with you about Five Little Indians. I thought, and, I, and I'm going to bring up something that hasn't been discussed yet, and that is Mariah. Mm. And yes. Clara coming home, home, to her culture, you know, to to her her origin story, to Mariah's home, and Mariah bringing her in this stranger and just hugging her whole soul. That was the most lovely, beautiful part. And then you know reintroducing her in a very loving way to the sweat lodge and to invite her to heal herself. And eventually, you know, she was able to come to terms with losing Lily. Mm. And that, that to me was coming home. Mm, you know, yeah. there, there was no book among all of them, I think that did that better. But mm. I think that in Scarborough, another place that really felt like home was Marie. You know, I'm a mom too, and I, I have two daughters, and I know what it's like to be a mom with little kids. And she had a little boy, Johnny, who's autistic. She had, well, thank, thank goodness, you know, um, that the little girl was so whole, Sylvie. And then she had the husband who was so severely injured, he couldn't even really get off the couch. How did she do that? But she made this home, right? She looked after Johnny like he was the most precious thing in the world. She looked after Sylvie, helping her with her puzzles, and she loved her husband. I mean, that she created a home out of, out of the most extreme poverty and difficult situation you could imagine. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone. We'll have to leave it there. That's it for this round. Oh. 
They're Hillary going Reeves. fast today, Ali. It's going They're fast. fast. We're We're going going. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. You're going to enjoy all of it. I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> Canada Reeves, I mentioned this yesterday. It is a celebration of great books at, at its core, but it is also a competition. <laughs> what does it take to get your book to the final day? Well, here are some words of advice from past Canada Reads finalists. Let's listen to this. And the secret to winning Canada Reads is, quite frankly, a whole lot of preparation and a little bit of luck. It's a lot harder <laughs> than it might seem. And the stakes are high because everyone around that table wants to win. You have to have sharply honed negotiation skills. All I could think about was like being in university and bluffing my way through everything. <laughs> so I actually approached the entire competition like it was a trial. You want to argue a point so that the people who have to make a decision have no doubt. The goal of a debate is to exchange ideas and to grow as people, not simply to win. You can win an argument and still lose in the grand scheme of things. Be assertive. Don't let anyone talk over you. Even if they have something good to say, they can wait until you're done. And don't be afraid to get fierce, but stay cool. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a balancing act. Those were the voices of past Canada Reads finalist Clara Hughes, Cameron Bailey, Stephen Page, Lainey Louie, Humble the Poet, and Ganya Dio Horn. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. All right, the three contending books each depict lived experiences and explore different challenges or hardships that the characters must endure. Which book's portrayal of finding the fortitude to push forward in the face of difficult circumstances was the most compelling? Mark, let's start with you. Well, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the other books, but I have to use this to kind of toot my own horn for a sec. And <laughs> um, I just think early in the book, the character of Big Kit was so stunning to me because the first time she has violence erupt to, uh, with her at the dining room, and she leaves and, and Wash is so upset, but Big Kid is like, no, I thought I was going to be killed. I'm alive and I will keep going because it is. And I thought, my God, that courage to overcome that pain and adversity. I think that the part in Nova Scotia, where we really get to look at sort of Canada's black history, which we don't see very much, the surveillance of a black man in Canada, contrasted to this idea that, oh, Canada's a safe haven, the British dominion, but the realities, the intercommunity struggles for the black people, Wash faced as well. But I think the very, you know, where he was really had so much fortitude was in his searching for Titch, and, and so doggedly that drove Christian a little bit nuts. <laughs> but I think that Tan Tana speaks to it. Tana in the character is going, get over it, Wash. Why do you have to find this? She even takes him to the abolition, abolitionist house where he's given a box of his history because he has no connection to that as an enslaved boy. And it didn't work because he just, that didn't, and, and it was amazing. Most people don't know I'm adopted. And I had a moment in my life where my mother brought me that box of like, here's your history. And in there, I found that I was born Jeffrey. That was my name. And at 31 years old, it was such a like, social construct, that, but I'm Mark Tewksbury, but I'm Jeffrey. And it, it, I disconnected from my adopted past. I, I doubled down on my, on my biological past. I doubled down on my adopted family. I didn't want to know the past. I wanted to start from here. And I could really relate to that with Titch. That, that box didn't work. He needed to find the answers for his own in real time. And for that, I give him a lot of fortitude. Christian? I want to bring it to my book. Um, you know, we talk about fortitude. I mean, I think it's just interesting you just mentioned, you know, Tana tells Titch, why don't you get over it? This is something that's been told to residential school survivors since the 60s. You know, move on, you know, that, that's the past. You need to get over it, rejoin society. Um, Michelle beautifully illuminates why in some cases that's not possible. We see Maisie, who I forget who criticized us yesterday, felt, you know, very short. I think it was no, you. No, Maisie's my favorite character. Um, favorite. Someone said, someone said <laughs> Maisie was too short and felt a bit lacking hope, but she showed that sometimes these survivors cannot move forward and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And then we have someone like Lucy who is really trying to move forward and carry forward her generation. I mean, all these characters overcome that in their own way and not one way is better than the other. And that's what I loved about it. 
bringing it back to Scarborough. <laughs> um, I think there's a common theme here, but I think the fortitude within this character is I want to talk about Miss Hina because I don't think she's really spoken of enough, you know, within her own uh, resilience of speaking with her supervisor at the faculty center of being completely and incredibly racist brought through and introduced through these emails, which I think just shows the kind of microaggressions that happen on a day-to-day -day basis um, and the day-to-day -day things that Miss Hina faces. You know, I think she really blurs the lines between good and bad because all the things that we are cheering Miss Hina for, she's not necessarily supposed to be doing, you know? She's not supposed to be giving out water, food, clothing, blankets, anything that's really a necessity to these people that are coming to a literacy center. Um, and that literacy, literacy center becomes a sort of home for these kids, a home for the parents, because it's not necessarily about where you sleep. It's about the people and the situations and what you're surrounded by. And with Miss Hina's resilience and bravery to, A, put her job on the line by blurring these good and bad kind of narratives and, you know, doing all the things that she's not exactly supposed to be doing, it just really shows how if we band together as the system has failed us as a community, we can create a system that shows truth and um, actually works for the marginalized individuals. I don't think uh, the three of you who just spoke need to feel any shyish and uh, sheepishness about bringing up your own books. That's why yeah. we have free agents to, <laughs> totally, to go in totally. a different direction. To come and attack us. Yeah, I agree about Hina. And I, I would just add, you know, that on the other hand, you know, the supervisor had this power, right? She, ha she had the power to do good and she chose not to. And, um, and, and you know, the call out to supervisors is when you see, you know, that vulnerability is to not double down and make it harder. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, a lot of supervisors raise to these positions and they're not very well versed in humanity. You know, they get more enthralled with their own power structure than they do in the actual issue. So, um, so that's the antithesis of fortitude of character. And I, yeah, and we need to always be mindful as supervisors. Um, I think that for Five Little Indians, the one that stood out to, to me for fortitude is, is Clara. You know, I mean, I loved Clara. She was angry. You know, she would beat on people, get on their backs. And, you know, her anger just came through. And I, I love that because she had the right to that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like she was so abused. Um, and but then she learned and but but she had to learn on her own. You know, she had to she had to fight for her position. She and she would move and she would shift and she would she would start selling salmon and then she got in, inter, interested in the American Indian movement and went, that's for me. And I loved it when she's driving across the border and listening to Buffy St. Marie, you mm -hmm. know, and just <laughs> rocking along to that. It was beautiful. Mm. And then eventually, you know, ultimately, you know, finding herself with the help of, of Mariah and relinking up with Howie, like that must have been so difficult. Mm. And yet she did. And so I just, she just overcame, you know, generations mm. of, of difficulty I in that want, one We life. have a minute and a half left. I'd yeah, love yeah, to get Absolutely. Karen, uh, Enjoying the free agent playing the card <laughs> now. Good job, guys. But uh, I have to say, hands down, Five Little Indians certainly uh, was the book really that showed us that fortitude of the, the characters and the fortitude of resiliency that's inside each one of us really to rebuild, to recreate ourselves. And in that recreation, I think I found that incredible uh, incredible set I think in the book I will I will come back to criticize one point in five little Indians but for me personally you know um, the, the fortitude of that resiliency is that believing in ourselves that we are not trees we are human beings we are adjustable we are adaptable we are we, we don't have roots like the trees we have legs for a reason so we can move and find our opportunity and create it if we, if we don't have it in front of us. Uh, but in, in Five Little Indians, I, I want to say that, uh, that Michelle's novel, um, a little bit at some points, um, it was steering emotions out of our throat. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it was leaving us breathless, especially, you know, at so many points, um, just in one example, the ending with, with Maisie's ending, you know, that, that was really a hard part for me to even imagine. How, how, how was that possible? And uh, with Five Little Indians as well, I just felt that there was um, a wide variety of uh, phrases and, and uh, epitaphs uh, that I just didn't find appropriate for the adult characters.
I, okay, oh. we'll have to leave it there. Oh, God, you can't leave me like that. <laughs> <laughs> you got some good. You got some good. It happened to me yesterday. You have 30 seconds. It if you have 30 seconds, so. yes. yes. No, I just wanted to say, I think it, you're wrong. I think Michelle, in fact, took very much sensitivity to make this not shoving emotion in your face. If you read the book, mm -hmm. actually, most of it doesn't take part in the school at all. She doesn't really focus on the trauma within the school. She did that deliberately so that she's not shoving this trauma porn in your face. So I just, I totally totally disagree. I think she was very careful with that. It's still oh. hard hitting though. Hey, that it's is hard that, hitting. Of that is it for this round. <laughs> Thank you. Also, I thought Suzanne might need a moment uh, after Tarek took a jo jab at trees, you know, as a first <laughs> oh, no, no, Smart <laughs> Trees? All no, right. Trees. Personality too. This <laughs> debate, um, well, basically, you know, yesterday, Tarek, we want to go back to your words. At the end of the show, you had said love is the answer. Hate is the cancer, and yes. and so we decided let's <laughs> let's talk about love. What do these books reveal about love? Um, Suzanne, let's start with you. You know, I I think the one that stands out the most for me is in Scarborough with being in his mom. Um, what a lovely, lovely story. I I disagree with who, who who was. I think it was Christian that was saying it was a bit. You know that Bing's mom. You know, she loved him from the very start. That's true, but you know, as a mom, you just do. And and yes, there is the the LGBTQ rejection. I, I don't disregard that at all. That that happens, but there was something about her love that was so she had to learn too, right? She had to, and she she had to learn to split from her husband. She had to learn, you know, to how to navigate in this in this very impoverished life that she had. And then, you know, at the end when Bing is having his dance, <laughs> I, I laughed, I cried when, you know, when it's going <laughs> back and forth between the dad, be, you know, trying to stab the back of his neck and putting his hand on the frying pan and going, you know, he's losing himself. And, and Bing's mom, Ma, is just like, go Bing. And she rate, makes that, that outfit and he's, you know, he, he's dancing. I just want to dance with someone and I just like, ripping off the lapels and ripping off the suspenders and Ma is just like in tears, you know, just cheering him on. That was love, you know, that was pure love. You know what I loved is each of these books that are left made me cheer for the characters. So like there's a moment where I'm like, page 93, Bing's gay, yeah. yay! Yeah. A, when How We Met Clara, Clara, yay! They're intersected. When, when, when Wash goes to fight for his name on Ocean House, yay! Like the, there's those moments in this book. I think love in, in Washington Black comes through his drawing, um, through his prodigy, which leads to real life love, which I think is one of the most beautiful parts of all of these books. Nova Scotia, when Wash is falling in love with Tana, it took me back to sort of a real coming of age story. It felt like a mini story within the larger book that had its own feeling. And that led to his love of conservationist, you know, he, his ability at that time to not think to kill an octopus, but to keep it alive is so radical for 1830. And then his love of craft to find the, a guy that will build the aquarium that's complicated, complicated enough. I love that stream. And I just end with this whole process has connected me back to the love of reading. And that's, I think, ultimately what this show is all about. Malia, what do these books reveal about love in your mind? For me, I feel like I haven't played the Bing card and I feel like he's such a golden nugget and so I'm so glad that you brought him up. Um, between him and his mom Edna, I feel like we see that love in all the different variants that it can take, um, whether that's towards his learning and his knowledge and his capability of being such an intellectual at such a young age and that underestimated ability between that. Um, but I also want to focus back on Sylvie as well, which I know that we talked up on the first day and the second day um, about how Sylvie, she was almost used as leverage for the other characters. And I think that was sort of the point with Catherine Ennend as well writing this. She has been treated as an adult her entire life to the point where she has had no time to think about herself. She has only thought about others. 
um, and exerted herself so much where if she doesn't know who she is, how are we able to? And so seeing her go through and her own talents between storytelling, which we see later in the book and how that's kind of shaped who she is. She is a storyteller and that's how she copes with her past and what she's been through personally into more of an individuals for everyone out there. And I thought that was really interesting how Catherine kind of combined that, especially from her own experience, kind of being from Miss Hina's perspective as the faculty um, head there. I just, just wanted to get that out. Sure, <laughs> Christian? Well, I want to talk about love in Five Little Indians. I think it's a big statement on the love the indigenous community has had to form for itself. There has been no outside love for them during, especially right after residential schools. So they had to take upon that love for themselves. And we see this in many ways. Within the school, we see, you know, when Lucy's finally leaving the mission, her friend makes her a purse out of recycled fabric as a gift. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate form of indigenous love is a gift, a form mm -hmm. of adornment. I loved that. And then in later years, you know, even with someone like Lucy and Kenny, mm -hmm. um, even though Kenny often runs away and he's not comfortable settling down and he's running away from his past, Lucy never really gets mad at him and she kind of understands him even though he's abandoning her and their child. She has that form of love and compassion for him. I think it shows a bigger picture of how all different tribes, even if you're in a residential school, if you're not, we've all understood each other and we've all lifted up each other. Final word to you, Tarek. Um, I, uh, I absolutely adore what, what has been said, and I, um, I, I find myself really in a hard position now to just uh, even think um, about the, all the other points that were not mentioned. But in a way that I wanted to connect the books, you know, to the true meaning of love for me, which is, you know, the, the true passion for something, and if, for a character, for, for an incident, for an ending. Uh, for me, I connected love in, in Five Little Indians to the set of behaviors and to the intimacy, you know, between the characters at the end and throughout the, the chapters. Uh, I connected it with Scarborough to, to passions and, and commitment. And within Washington Black, I connected it to uh, closeness, protectiveness and trust. You know, that's, that's exactly what, what true love for, for, for me is, is all about. And, uh, you know, I, I really had, had the chance to dig deeper into uh, a lot of the, 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 the characters um, yesterday, but I found myself really in, uh, you know, confused a little bit about, you know, how could love be more shining through the pages in books like this? And uh, I don't think really this is going to be the winning factor for me today. That's going to help me in my vote. Okay. All right. That is it for this round. <laughs> And that is also it for today's debate. No way. Wow. <laughs> you said we were going fast, and you weren't wrong, Mark. We really did speed through that. It is time to vote. Oh, my gosh. Oh. I really wasn't ready for that I'm not today. Ready I either. thought there was like another <laughs> little block. We got a second. <laughs> <laughs> Panelists, your ballots are in front of you, in the exact same place they've been for the early part of this week. You know, the procedure here, you place an X beside the book that you want to eliminate from the competition. And once you have voted, Winnie from the Canada Reads team will take your ballot. Again, this has been a, a theme throughout the week. I took more Mark time and today. Christian. I is that I took, I took you, taking your time? time? Yeah, was Mark's time. definition of taking his time is still pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> you're, a, you're a guy who moves fast. <laughs> I'm a I thought about you. it. You thought about it? I did. Tarek always. I'm remaining till the end of yes, the exam, yes. using every it's second. Hard. Suzanne's it's well responsible. I really want to do it justice. <laughs> all, right. all the way, trust, <laughs> yeah. for rest. Oh. I remind people, once again, there are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. You have voted and Winnie has taken the, uh, the, the ballots from you. And as, uh, as she tabulates those votes. We wonder which title which will uh, will go today. Will it be Washington Black by Essie Adujan? Mark Tewksbury is championing that novel. Will it be Five Little Indians by Michelle Good? This book was chosen by Christian Allaire. Will it be Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez? Malia Baker is backing that title. Whichever one it is, it will join Life in the City of Dirty Water by Clayton Thomas Mueller, which was voted off on day one. And we'll also join What Strange Paradise by Omar El Akkad, which was championed by Tarek Haddad and voted off yesterday. 
And as we talked about yesterday, Scarborough and Washington Black had votes against it yesterday. Only five little Indians did not have any votes against it, and you can't help but I wonder can't. if that will change today. I know that there were arguments that were brought up uh, against Five Little Indians. I also know that it's a book that everybody loved, but I also know that you had love for every every That's book right. on That's this right. uh, on the tables. This in was front the of hardest you. vote for me, guys. This was really difficult. Really hard. Thank you, Winnie. Winnie from the Canada Reads team has handed me the ballots. Okay. Suzanne Simart, how did you vote? <laughs> why cut? Why start with me? <laughs> this was such a hard vote. So what I came down to is what made me cry the most and what made me laugh the most. And so I voted against Washington Black, even though I love that book. Okay. We have one vote against Washington Black. Mark Tewksbury, how did you vote? I voted because it needed one vote against it, Five Little Indians, just because, yeah, clean record. Okay. We have one vote against Five Little Indians. Christian Allaire, how did you vote? I was torn, but I did vote against Scarborough. That's one vote against Scarborough, one vote against Five Little Indians, and one against Washington Black. For the fourth vote, Malia Baker, how did you vote? I had the same mindset as Mark, and I needed one vote, so I voted for Five Little Indians. Okay, so we have two votes against Five Little Indians. Tarek Haddad, how did you vote? Um, because I wanted to see Scarborough and Five Little Indians in the finale, I voted against Washington Black, but it was absolutely awesome job today, Mark. Thank you. With two votes against Washington Black and two votes against Five Little Indians, we have a tie. <laughs> Love a tie. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it means I'm out because Christian votes. Let me turn to the Canada Reads rule book to explain. We have this. a tie. The panelists who did not vote against either of the books up for elimination must break the tie. This is the case even if that panelist is defending one of the two books up for elimination. The case of even if applies, Christian Lair, that means you. It is up to you to break the tie. I am voting against Washington Black, unsurprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> With that, Washington Black has been eliminated. You did an amazing job. Yes, Mark. absolutely. Thank absolutely you. amazing. Yeah. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you, guys. I don't know how comforting that will be, Mark, but I will tell you that I, I fully agree. I've seen six Canada Reads, um, you know, competitions over the last six years, and uh, your passion, your preparedness, your thoroughness, mm -hmm. quite fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a little surprised. I knew it could go either way. I was hoping, Suzanne, you were kind of the unknown vote, and I knew that if you swung, that I could get into the final, but it didn't go that way. I had a feeling Malia and I both might just go against Five Little Indians because you've been so clear all week. And But all three are great. I just want to say, I really did believe coming in here, this is the one book that connects us. And I 100% I think th those are books that need to be read by all Canadians. Not just sure it was in this context, although it will be, which is great. Every policymaker needs to read Scarborough to see what the hell is happening when we're pushing poverty out and gentrifying communities, et cetera. Every Canadian needs to read Five Little Indians. I think it's so accessible, Christian. I, I, that's why I think it's perfect for curriculum because students would just be all over it and be inspired to act. And then to learn that with the residential school history in mm -hmm. conjunction, amazing. I thought maybe the book that we needed when we come home right now, because the news is so hard, um, was maybe to escape, to transport us. And I kind of went all in with that idea that this is, I think, one of the better written books. It takes us away, we can feel the settings. I also understand these issues are, uh, these books are uh, very important issues. And it's just a different way to debate and full respect and it's been amazing for everybody. Essie, it's been just the most Greatest pleasure working with you on this. Sorry we won't get that glacier picnic. <laughs> Darn you guys, you realize what you're taking from You know, me you here. can still, you you can still go. Done. But I All just, right. you know, it was just a joy to represent a really unique, I think, Canadian masterpiece that's written with the uh, sort of mimicking a 19th century novel but made it accessible to a whole new right. generation of people. Thank you, Mark. We have to leave it there. Congratulations, Mark. We Thank have, you. that's it, three votes down, only one to go. Two books are left. The final two books are Scarborough and Five Little Indians.
<laughs> Tomorrow, there will be just one book left standing, and it will be named the winner of the Great Canadian Book Debate. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. We'll see you one last time tomorrow. Until then, read on, Canada. I mean, that was exactly If you're watching on TV or online, the show isn't over. It is time for the Canada Reads After Show. We just had our third Canada Reads elimination. We said goodbye, um, not easily, to Washington <laughs> Black uh, with you know mixed emotions at the table, and um, it is always tough to see a book go. But but again, as I said yesterday, at its core, whatever else we do on this show, this is about celebrating books. So I would really like to take this moment uh, to celebrate. Washington Black and, 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 and talk about some of the very, very positive things that were in that book. Uh, so, well, Suzanne, why don't we start with you? You were, I yeah, think you were quick to... I was to, about to talk I about know. that. Yeah, it well, was like, the most beautifully written book, it, or it is. Um, so the descriptions, the, you know, the transporting to the place, it was beautifully done. But for, for the reason I voted against it is for the very reasons that you just articulated so well, is that these two books are the books in Canada that connect us in this moment. Um, and I, I think you're right, they need to be read by everyone. And, um, and so, does, so does Essie's book, but, but for Canada right now in this moment where we, we have choices in front of us about how we're gonna move forward, these are the books to read for the contemporary times. I kind of thought I was, I feel a little bit like we didn't get to it, but this whole notion of even freedom and what it means to be Canadian is kind of the issue of the moment as well. We didn't, I didn't dive in there, but you know, it's the first time in my life when the women's hockey team <laughs> won a gold medal and trucks were driving around with flags on it and I wasn't exactly sure why the trucks' flags were there. If they were celebrating, I mean, they're not mutually exclusive, but you know what I mean. It's a time where our country is reckoning with what it means to be Canadian and free. So I thought this book might have kind of appealed to that, but it's a, it's a little bit of a, a, a stretch to make that argument. It's not quite as in your face and obvious as Scarborough and Five Little. And that's why I focused today on freedom. Uh, I really felt it through your opening statement. It, it came really through. Thank you. Thank you. Terek, I wanted to ask you to sort of dig in a little bit about your feelings about uh, Washington Black well, as I well. Voted, I voted um, against Washington Black twice. Did I um, almost sway you? <laughs> <laughs> you almost actually got there. You know, if it was not really the Scarborough and Five Little Indians in, in the finale, I, certainly Washington Black should have been there. But um, I just want to make a comment about uh, yesterday. My, my, all my comments, all my arguments were not against the author. It's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing author. And the writing was incredible. It was absolutely about the book. It was about how um, I saw myself in it, how I didn't see myself in it, uh, how things could have been better, you know, some of the descriptive elements that went into it, how it could have been short, the technical shortcomings that, the comings that I have seen in the book. Uh, all of that, but overall, it is a, a fabulous story, and I really hope that all Canadians are going to read it. Christian, what did you enjoy about Washington Black? <sighs> well, I mean, I'm a sucker for writing and craft. I'm a writer, so that, of course, that's going to be what I focus on. Um, I did think it was the most beautifully written book, aside from my own. Um, but I really, you know, the writing. I think if we're debating books, you really have to put importance on the writing style. And that one for me was the most transportative. It was the most beautifully written. I could see it. And so that's why I keep not voting it out. And I'm wow. sad, but yeah, that's I, I, the writing style for me, it, it trumped everyone. Malia? I mean, I'm just gonna echo what you all said. The writing, whatever Essie does, I will be following. I remember speaking to you at the beginning of everything and saying that if she wrote something about a napkin, I would still be wholeheartedly <laughs> interested in it. And with that being said, it just shows her skills as a writer and um, her well-versed sense in literature. So it just, I'm a fan of her and I'm such a fan of you. And that combination together was so strong and empowering and, Oh, sad to see you go. Thanks, Maria. Thank you so much. <laughs> but you're joining a really great That's group. Oh, I know. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. It's all up for grabs <laughs> tomorrow, guys. The <laughs> Don't, that, that vote against Five Lilies was just because you needed one going in. It's a blank exactly. slate again tomorrow, you guys. you got to win us over. Okay. Yeah, you, enjoy, you, you, you join this esteemed group of free agents, Mark. <laughs> oh, uh, my afternoon who are, has changed. This is it. Untethered. You are untethered. Uh, and you're, um, you know, you're somebody who will be wooed. And, I can uh, tell you it's a much better place. 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your loyalties are, uh, are, are unclear to those who remain in the competition, and that's, um, that's exciting. That's a good thing, and it only makes for a, for a, a better finale. But it was, uh, it was tremendous what you, what you did, and I'm, you, I'm happy that you might actually get a nap or, uh, you know, a <laughs> leisurely <laughs> meal yeah. or a workout. Yeah, exactly. I think you deserve it. You Thank really you. do deserve Much it. Much appreciated. Thank yeah. you, Ali. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you very much to everybody. I also, uh, not only thanks to you, but thank you. You know, we're a multi-platform show. Facebook, YouTube, all the CBC platforms, we are there. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to, again, Mark Tewksbury, Krishna Lair, Malia Baker, Dr. Suzanne Samard, and Tarek Hadhad. We're one vote away from choosing the winner of Canada Reads 2022. Thank you, everyone. Um, they'll be back tomorrow to make one last decision. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. Until tomorrow, read on, Canada. <laughs> <laughs>